The it's showtime! All attendees are in listen-only mode. This is Dr. Minarsik, and today is Tuesday, October 30th, you know, the day before what we call Halloween, and this is the 16th session of our free online global medical school pathology course. Uh, the music that you just heard was donated to us by the person who you see on your screen. Her name is Marina Buriak. And furthermore, I know she's here because I just saw her in the audience. So thank you, Marina. All of the uh, music that we have today uh, has been submitted by Marina. So what else can we say today? Let's say that um, I guess the first thing we should say is do the test. Uh, make sure that, you know, uh, storms haven't blown out everybody's computer and internet system. So, you know, the first question is, uh, can you hear me well? Okay, I'm very happy to hear that because I noticed at the very beginning I got a little red uh, air uh, light indicating there might have been some uh, audio problems, but I don't think so. I think we're doing fine. Everybody's saying they could hear me well. I, and I know some of you, uh, probably, hopefully all of you, have seen the array on your screen now. So, uh, where, uh, what do you see on your screen? Okay, so somebody made the comment already. This is Autumn. This was taken from my local park here right across the street. Um, no reason to have any big uh, more announcements, maybe a couple little things. Probably the first announcement 
is that today uh, will be infectious diseases part two. You know that we started part one uh, five days ago uh, on Thursday, so we'll be continuing it all day today. I don't think we'll finish it, but we might finish it. It depends on how you know things go. And uh, we'll definitely have a lab with this whenever we are done, even if it's in the next session. So today is Infectious Disease Part 2. Maybe you heard uh, my dog Woofy announcing it. Uh, have, is anybody there that saw the announcement of my dog announcing uh, the session for today? Some of you check the uh, Facebook site. Okay, good. So you're all happy that Woofy uh, is an announcer now. Woofy was very, very jealous of Shazina, so he thought he could do a better job. And uh, he also thinks he's cuter, but there's probably a lot of people that would disagree with that. Uh, I want to mention one word. Uh, we uh, know there's a very, very horrible storm going on on the East Coast. Uh, a lot of our students were from the East Coast. I suspect that if you are on the East Coast of the United States, you may not be here today because there's millions of people without power. So just want to let you know, you know, we're praying for you, and we know that you're going to survive this. So you may not be here live, but when you do download the movie, you're going to know that everybody that's here is cheering for you because you know we're going to make it through the storm. Uh, is anybody here uh, in the middle of the storm right now, possibly? Uh, I don't know if anybody here, I would suspect, uh, I don't see a lot of people saying yes, so... That big power blackout is probably preventing you from being here. And I want to say one more thing before we get into our uh, infectious disease discussion. My computer is getting kind of old. Now, you know, I built computers as a hobby. I took great pride in keeping this computer up to date and fast and clean and all that stuff. But, you know, if you've ever saw Star Wars, did you ever see... Uh, this character Han Solo, whenever he tried to start up his uh, rocket, his spaceship called the Millennium Falcon, he would have to kick it a few times and finally it would go. Well, I feel like my computer is becoming the Millennium Falcon. I, had a, I have to kick it too many times to make it go fast. Now I have two more co fast computers downstairs, so at some point in time we just may switch over. But this is my old, trusty, reliable, super fast computer I built myself, and it's been working fine for many years. So, you know, let's hope that that doesn't die either. Okay, we're ready to rock and roll. Uh, we've made our announcements, and uh, probably a good thing to do now is uh, make the same sort of disclosure that we did in the last session. Now, you know... Uh, I made sort of a big apology at the beginning because I'm always in conflict with the uh, infectious disease chapter and how it relates to your microbiology course, which most of you said you had. So, you know, once again, my apology is that uh, it's not going to be anywhere near what a, even a bad microbiology course is like. But we're going to still run things down quite a bit, do a lot of summaries, and emphasize more the, uh, the disease aspects rather than go into the history of every single bug you could imagine. We'll probably just hit the major ones. Now, last session, my fears were a little bit allayed because I felt like we did a good job. Uh, so let's hope that that keeps up. If you remember, we're running down the uh, phylogenetic list, you know, with a phylum, you know, basically... Uh, being sort of um, a big, big class of animals and a class being under a phylum and then an order and then a family and then a genus and then a species. So a lot of the specific organisms that we talk about are genus and species, you know, like mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, there is a huge, huge, huge class uh, called insecta. In fact, it's the biggest class in the animal kingdom. So of the so-called like two million uh, species on earth, I think that insects are about like 1.5. And there is more weight of insects on planet earth than all of the other animals combined by about a factor of 10. And of course we have another class called arachnids. So class insecta, class arachna, arachnida, are under the phylum Arthropoda, which means they have uh, jointed legs and they have a chitin skeleton. But the differentiation between insects and arachnids, you may know, 
uh, besides others. The big one is that the insects have six legs and the arachnids have eight. Now, you may not be able to see that right away, but any identification of a critter, if you do a careful leg count, you'll know whether it's in the insect family or arachnid family. These are the family of what we call ectoparasites. And even though they can also be technically called metazoans because they're more than one cell, that is generally reserved for the worms being called metazoans and the arthropods, whether they're insects or arachnids, whether they're adults or larva, larva are generally called ectoparasites because they don't really get too far into the skin. They generally do all of their damage on the body surface. They're just too big to enter uh, usually. So the uh, human insects of concern, the ectoparasites, would be in the family of lice. You know, whether those lice, louses, lice, are on your uh, head hair, in which case it would be called pediculosis capitis, because capitis is your head. The same or closely related species on your body hair would be pediculosis corporis, because it's on your body. And then there's another one that's not in the same genus. It's called Therus pubis, and it looks exactly like a little crab, and that's reserved for pubic hair. Those are the pubic lice. Then we have bed bugs. You know, they're true bugs. You know, most of the time we call, uh, we say the word bugs, we're not really referring to the true uh, order or family of bugs, but bed bugs are true bugs. And then, of course, there are the critters, also insects, six legs like all of these are, that infect uh, animals largely. But if you have a dog or a cat, you know that those critters can bite you as well, and they could probably jump like about a hundred times higher than they are. Most humans can jump about one-third of their body uh, height. Fleas can jump like about a thousand times uh, greater than their body height. So let's go to the insects first, which are over here. And I'm hoping to get them. There we go. Um, just for identification mostly, uh, you know, a lot of us kids had these because uh, in school, there, if, if one kid has lice, it's very possible that if you play with the kid or wrestle, these things are going to be. And, of course, the uh, louse, whether it's a body louse or a head louse, they generally uh, not only live in skin that has hair, but their eggs or nits, like you see here, are also attached to the, uh, uh, the base of the hair as well, very close to the follicle. These are the pediculosis critters, pediculosis of the head being pediculosis capitis, pediculosis of the body being pediculosis corporis, and then the third louse is not pediculosis at all. It's a, it's a word that has one, two, it starts out with four consonants. Not many words in the English language start out with four consonants, but this one does. It's called Pterus, P-H-T-H-I-R-U-S, pubis, is the true genus and species name. And these guys are uh, basically uh, confined to the pubic area. So if a louse looks like a crab, it's probably from pubic hair. If it looks like this, it's probably from either uh, head hair or body hair. Now the bed bugs, you know, uh, you may not have seen them. You know, maybe you have. I don't know where you are. Uh, they generally, you know, live in the bed, and they can bite, and uh, they generally look like true bugs, you know, with a broad, you know, uh, abdominal, abdominal shield like you get in most of the uh, critters of the bug family. Of course, the distinguishing thing about the fleas is that they have very, very, very powerful hind legs, and you know they only have six, so there's going to be one, two, three on this side, and one, two, three on the other side, which means the fleas are also in the insect family. Also for identification, and sometimes mistaken for bugs, are the arachnids, but they are the arthropods that have eight legs. And of course the chief critters affecting man are ticks and mites. Just about all of the arachnids that involve or infect or parasitize or chew on humans are either ticks or mites. Um, 
not only do they cause local damage by new, but they carry diseases as well, some of which we've already discussed. So even though that tick looks like it has only six, if you look closely, there's going to be another small one. You have to examine these things carefully. Plus, it looks like a tick as well. Now, here's a guy that you could truly count four on each side. So that's a mite. Mites are generally the very, very smallest of insects. Some mites are almost microscopic in size. I think uh, if you look uh, in your dog's ear and he's scratching in his ear and you look, take your otoscope and you look into his ear, you're probably going to see tiny, tiny little black dots, no more than a, probably half of a millimeter. And those are full adult mites. Now the problem with adult mites is besides doing a lot of local damage like scabies, for example, they can also deposit their larva into the hair follicles. Uh, chiggers do this. Here's another uh, mite called Demodex, in which you could see little larvae growing out of the hair follicle uh, adjacent to the hair shaft itself. And that's what a lot of the mites do. Not only do they like to uh, live and chew and feed off your keratinaceous material, but they like to raise their babies there as well. Of course, the adult spiders now, you know, spiders are different from ticks. Spiders are different from mites. The spiders, the two spiders of concern, are the black widow spider. And even though there's been a lot of a mysterious horror associated with this, you know, here we have Halloween tomorrow. There's probably about 20 black widow spiders on my neighbor's doors right now. They have this little red violin, if you look carefully. And, uh, you know, you might be ca uh, called widow because you think that they're fatal. Actually, the true uh, mortality rate overall for a black widow spider bite is less than 1%. You know, that might be similar to a wasp's thing, you know. There are probably hundreds or thousands of more people dying from wasp stings every year than black widow spider bites. Of course, the black widow spiders... Uh, can cause a painful bite as well. Now another spider, which I don't have a picture of because it's not really di very distinctive looking, is the brown recluse spider. And whereas it probably doesn't have much of a high uh, mortality rate, the thing about the brown recluse is that it releases enzymes which basically digest all your soft tissues. This is not an unusually large reaction for a brown recluse spider. Some of them are even uh, causing uh, almost amputations and extremities. So these are the uh, major critters to worry about in a class arachnida, and you could all identify them. It's almost certain that somewhere along your uh, step one exam, someone's gonna put a picture of one of these things and you're gonna have to identify whether it's an insect or a arachnid, and if it's an arachnid, what kind, whether it's a spider, a tick, or a mite, or even a larval mite. And somebody's also gonna uh, put an insect and in. You know, they might be uh, tricky enough where, you know, maybe you might count uh, six legs, but there's really eight, so I don't know. I, I think it's good to have visual identification. Probably the most common mite in the world is scabies. Scabies is just another mite that feeds off your skin. This is a scanning false color electron micrograph, and you can see there's a scabies here, there's one kind of living here, there's another one here, and they're having a good time you know, playing in your stratum corneum of your skin. It's, uh, it doesn't have to be really hairy skin, but sometimes it is. And scabies causes a very, very wide variety of skin lesions. You know, there is nothing diagnostic about uh, scabies. Uh, they can cause, they can mimic almost any inflammatory or ulcerative skin lesion. They itch an awful lot. Uh, the diagnostic test for scabies uh, is to, first of all, suspect it, although you probably wouldn't, and then scrape it, you know. And if you scrape it, you may see critters under even a low-power microscope that look something like this. And even though uh, I can tell you, if you were to Google uh, right now scabies, you would see skin lesions all over the body. One of the more common places is on the dorsal uh, aspect of the MP joints in the uh, in the hand, and uh, 
if you do a scraping in that area, you may very well see a critter like this. And remember, mites in general, look at, they're really not that much bigger than a couple of cells, are they? These are very, very small. That's an entire uh, organism of class arachnida, and it seems to be no more than a few uh, stratified squamous keratinized uh, flat cells uh, long. Okay, let's go into general barriers now. We've been talking a, little about, a lot about taxonomy, and I told you I really don't just like to run down the big taxonomy list. Uh, we're going to talk about, in general, uh, some features of infectious diseases, and then we're going to go into the more specific big four, you know, which is viruses, which is bacteria, which is fungi, and which is parasites. So when you look at the uh, barriers as the first line of defense for infectious organisms, it, it's not hard to figure out. It's, it's the natural mucosal barriers. It's skin. It's epithelium of your GI tract. It's epithelium of your respiratory tract. It's your urogenital epithelium, okay? Now, isn't it interesting that when you look at all four of these so-called uh, mucosal, natural, primary anatomic barriers, isn't it interesting that if you remember from histology, it's very likely you're going to get a nice little collection of lymphocytes underneath that mucosa. Remember Peyer's patches with GI or, you know, little inflammatory cells, macrophages, lymphocytes in the uh, dermis of skin, especially the papillary dermis, the one that's closest to the epidermis. A whole array of immune cells surrounding your bronchi and even your urogenital. So this lymphoid tissue is called MALT, standing for mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, and it's not uh, unlogical that you should have a lot of this under the first direct barriers from these critters. Now, here's another thing that's no big surprise. It's spread of the infectious process. And it's exactly the same as spread of a tumor. So when you have an infectious process going on, somewhere localized, it could be in the skin, it could be deeper, the first thing for it to do is just to have a direct extension into neighboring tissues, you know, just like a tumor. What's the secondary uh, route of uh, spread? Well, it's lymphatics. So a tumor uh, has a its metastasis through lymphatics, and so does an infectious inflammatory process as well. Could these critters eventually get into the blood? Yes, they can. Could just like... Uh, uh, tumor cells can. Can they go around nerve sheets and invade nerves? Yes, and some of they can. And there's a whole wide variety of neurotropic viruses and bacteria. So rather than just memorize this, just uh, rem remember that the spread of an infectious uh, pathogen reaction is the same as the spread of a tumor in terms of uh, anatomic things. Now, what about a release? Okay, we know that critters have to be transmitted and released, maybe directly, maybe spores, you know, maybe parts of it. But uh, one of the common ways for organisms to be released is through skin shedding, okay? I guarantee if you're scratching that, even that uh, um, mite area, uh, that some of those little critters are gonna be coming off, bacteria, viruses. What about coughing and sneezes? Look at all of the anatomic barriers that we talked about, whether it was skin, whether it was respiratory, whether it was urine, whether it was GI, whether it was blood. That is the route of transmission also. And whereas organisms in these various fluids or locations may not be infectious per se, that is how they basically can transmit transmit in many ways. Uh, the word vector enters the picture. We've talked about vectors before. So uh, a great way for organisms to spread is maybe not to be in direct contact with body fluids or urine, feces, blood, respiratory droplets or skin portions, but it's through uh, secondary animals, generally insects, but they could be other animals. They could be mammals. They could be rats. And these are called vectors. So an infectious disease 
in which a vector is a critical factor in the spread of the disease in humans is called a zoonosis. Zoo being the root word for life form. You know, like a rat, like an insect. Now, another mode of transmission, which is generally not as quite logical as the other one, but is a very popular uh, in the word, you know, politically correct, is the concept of a sexually transmitted disease, or STDs. So, a sexually transmitted disease is something that's transmitted sexually. Now, could that mean blood? Yeah. Could that mean urine? Yeah. Could it mean feces? Yeah. Could it mean respiratory? Yeah. Could it mean skin? So, uh, the general sexually transmitted disease is not specific for any body uh, epithelial barrier, but all it means is that it can be and historically is transmitted through sex. And you know, the whole long list of this, of, of most of the so-called venereal diseases are now called sexually transmitted diseases. The uh, Probably the main concept for you to remember, if, this, if there was only one PowerPoint in this whole out of 115 that you want to keep in your mind, it would look something like Ohm's Law. Now, if some of you have had engineering, you remember there's something called Ohm's Law. You know that a current, which is usually labeled as I, is directly proportional to V, which is the voltage. But it's inversely proportional to the resistance. You know, in other words, the more resistance, the less current. Isn't that obvious? Well, that's also the same exact equation when it comes to general infectivity. And infectivity of an organism is number one, its intrinsic virulence. So virulence is not the same as infectivity, although very often the words are used interchangeably because infectivity is the whole mechanism of infectious disease process where virulence is just the specific properties of the organism. And it may not even be the species of organism because different strains of, different, of the same species could have different virulence. We talked about virulence even being infected by the viruses that attack bacteria. And of course, probably more and more nowadays, the, even the most important concept is resistance. And of course, resistance is your immune system. But I put R there for resistance rather than immunity, because if I said I, it would look like there's another I. So infectivity is directly proportional to the organism's virulence, but it's inversely proportional to your body's resistance, and that's your immune system. And technically, if our immune systems were all perfect, and the world was in such a horribly violent place with critters, we probably wouldn't have infectious diseases, would we? So, infectivity in general is determined you know, by the specific organism. The organism, whether it's a virus, whether it's a bacteria, whether it's a fungus, I'm not being specific yet, may have a direct toxic or I would say a direct pathogenic effect on the host cell. I didn't want to use the word toxic because that would be the second mechanism where the agent doesn't have a direct effect on the host cell, but it secretes toxins it makes toxins. These are most uh, specific for bacteria, but even viruses, even any other infectious organism can be thought of as having toxins. And then the toxins themselves do the damage to the host cells rather than the organism directly. And you know, there are things called endotoxins. And of course, nowadays, endotoxins are more likely called lipopolysaccharides. And those are generally the products of gram-negative bacteria, or we'll say bacteria in general, even some uh, mostly uh, bacilli, but even cocci can secrete toxins. We'll say it's more the process of bacteria in general. And then the agent can cause a host cellular reaction. For example, like a granuloma. You can have a few mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria evoking a huge granulomatous response 
or even a huge acute inflammatory response, an abscess. And that inflammatory response itself causes a lot of damage, interferes with the function of the tissue or the organ. So those are the three ways, direct by the agent, toxins by the agent, or the host response itself is uh, interfering with, with the process, even if there may not be many agents in it or any toxins in it. Those are infectivity in general. Now we go down to viral infectivity. You have to remember, no matter what virus we're talking about, the virus has to have a way to attach. Okay, it's usually gene-controlled processes on the surface of the viral particle causing it to attach. Okay, then there has to be a way for that attached virus to enter its nucleic acid material into the host cell. And of course, if it's a uh, something that's going to convert, you know, human DNA to viral DNA, that's regular uh, uh, viral RNA, that's forward transcription, isn't it? If it uh, causes uh, RNA to become DNA, that's reverse transcription. So it would be a retrovirus, wouldn't it? So except for the retroviruses, transcription is forward. And then, of course, the translation. The virus has to make uh, its other proteins. The other genes have to go into effect. So that might result in uh, inclusions within the cell. And even though we have seen already many examples of viral inclusions, those are not the viruses themselves because no virus is really big enough to be seen easily by a regular light microscopy. It might result uh, in the process of the viral nucleic acid causing a decreased host cell function, even death, cell injury, cell lysis, and cell death if the virus replication and translation is extensive enough. Now, there may be also something called latency. This is the scary thing. When a virus enters a cell and it just stays there. It doesn't really start making or translating into proteins. Uh, that uh, is kind of scary because uh, cells which harbor latent viruses can be activated sometimes months, sometimes even years after they just happen to be sitting there. And very often when they are activated, they then may be undergoing the process of what we call transformation. So if you remember, we gave the extensive talk about malignant transformation. Well, sometimes viral uh, influences, viral nucleic acid is a very, very strong part of making those mutations in human cells which can cause tumors and cancers. Now, what about bacterial uh, infectivity? You know, the bacteria has to adhere to uh, human cells, human tissues as well. It has to have a method for entry as well. It may or may not have toxins. Uh, very likely, uh, many bacteria, I would like to think most, but I, I, I'll probably say most uh, of the damage that's done by bacteria is done by virtue of the bacterial toxins. Now, if the toxins were actually parts of the bacteria itself, endo inside the bacteria, that's called endotoxins. If the toxins were just secreted pro products by the bacteria, those are called exotoxins. Now nowadays people generally do not use the term endotoxin too much. Generally speaking, when you hear the term endotoxin, you're talking about a gram-negative bacteria, but we know that the gram-positives, we do it. We know cocci can do it. Uh, the products of the bacteria are usually in the biochemical family of what we call lipopolysaccharides. So it's very likely, rather than hearing the uh, term endotoxin, you may hear the LPS acronym instead. And of course, exotoxins are secreted by both gram-negative, gram-positive, and uh, they are generally proteins as well. So once again, with much of uh, bacterial infectivity, it's uh, 
probably not a direct bacterial reaction, although that happens a lot. It's uh, probably a little more likely to be the result of uh, toxins from the bacteria. Now, we're going to talk about another topic related to all this, which we said before. Remember before when we talked about autoimmune diseases and why do people's cells get attacked by their own defenses, or even more so, we talked about tumor cells. Was a, why do some tumor cells escape immune defenses? Well, that's once again the concept of immune evasion. And just like the body's own cells in autoimmune diseases or tumor cells, you know, they're very, very likely to meet with the body's own defenses. But how do they get through all that stuff? Well, one way is that they just build barriers so they can't be recognized. I, you know, I'm sorry, I keep thinking of that movie uh, Karate Kid. You know what, I'm just going to ask you, have, has anybody there seen the movie Karate Kid? I bet you a few of you have. I see a few people saying yes. Well, Mr. Miyagi is a grandmaster of karate, and he tells his uh, uh, um, student, Danielson, he says, Danielson, the best way to avoid punch is no be there. So inaccessibility is one of the main ways that these organisms can evade the immune system. Sometimes they can mute, mutate their antigens. They could vary their antigens. Just when you have the right antibodies getting ready to destroy portions of the organism, they decide to change them. Okay, so you may be sensitized by one bacteria and build up a great amount of antigens, but the next strain that comes back has different antigens. So it doesn't work, does it? It changed. Another thing is like to shed your antigens. You remember in some of these movies where, you know, they're going after a submarine, they want to torpedo it, or they're going after some of these jet fighters in the sky. The uh, submarines and the jet, they, they shed their antigens to make it look like that's where they are, but they really have shed them. Well, that's another trick that the critters do in general. They shed their antigens, and while their antigens are being attacked by antibodies, <laughs> the critter is laughing, and he got away, okay? Now, remember we had this concept of innate immunity, like toll-like receptors, and we talked about uh, barriers and things that were we call the family of natural immunity. Well, they can be fooled as well. So if you remember, the toll-like receptors, for example, were uh, generally derived from recognizing, you know, bacterial antigens, even though it's not an, a learned response, it's a natural response. Well, you could have uh, organisms, you could have pathogens, you could have infectious pathogens of any type resisting even the natural immunity. And last but not least, we saw this before, uh, is that the bugs themselves can go after the, after the immune system rather than vice versa. So very often when you look at an inflammatory response in which there are infectious pathogens present, you can actually see the pathogens going after the lymphocytes, going after the T cells. So the pathogens are destroying the soldiers that are supposed to come after them. So these are all mechanisms of immune evasion. Now, remember when we just took the equation and we said that that R was the most important thing, the body's resistance, the body's immunity? Uh, there is this whole concept and category now of infections of immunosuppressed hosts. And it's a long, 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 long list. And take a look at this. This is going to look like a very, very familiar slide because we saw this slide when we were talking about AIDS. This was the slide when we were talking about AIDS. We said this was the common opportunistic infections with AIDS patients. But what if I told you that it's also generally the list of diseases in immunosuppressed patients of any types, even patients that are on immunosuppressive agents. They're subject to attacks by protozoans, you know, cryptosporidium, pneumocystis, toxo, those are the big ones. Fungal, 
Fungal infections in generally do not happen in people with totally normal immune systems. The immune system breaks down either due to AIDS viral infection or any other thing that could break down your immune system. Fungal diseases are then common, not just superficial or dermatophytic or skin fungal infections, but the deep systemic fungi which usually mimic tuberculosis, like histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, and coccidiomycosis. Those are the big three, aren't they? Uh, bacterial infections also, TB at the top of the list. You know, probably uh, before the AIDS epidemic, uh, TB was still around. Uh, and when people got TB, they usually got it the way anybody got tuberculosis, you know, by being in contact with another one, maybe having a, a lowered immunity. But nowadays, in the United States at least, you have somebody coming in with whopping tuberculosis. The, uh, the first thing the infectious disease doctor or e even the emergency room doctor is going to think, well, is this an HIV patient? Okay. Uh, bacteria, or if you want to say fungal-like bacteria like nocardia, also very common, salmonella infections, and in terms of viral infections, most of the opportunistic viral infections are in the herpes family. So is CMV in the herpes family? Yes, it is. Is herpes simplex in the herpes family? Yes, it is. Is herpes zoster, or also called varicella, is that in the herpes family? Yes, it is. It's kind of interesting that even though, if we go back to the uh, concept of AIDS again, even though the HIV virus, if, if you don't mind the redundancy, is in not in the herpes family, most of the secondary opportunistic viral infections, including Kaposi's sarcoma, by the way, are in the herpes family. So look at that intimate relationship between the retrovirus and the herpes viruses. Uh, this is no big surprise either. How do you diagnose the specific critters, the specific infectious pathogens of various types? Well, sometimes we're lucky enough uh, actually to see parts of the organism under a routine microscope with H and E, or even grossly if it's large enough to be, you know, ectoparasite or a metazoan. Uh, some of the gram-positive, even gram-negative, are slightly visible, even without gram-staining of the tissues. Of course, the main uh, identification diagnosis for bacteria is possibly to do a gram-stain on the lesion itself. And even if you don't do that, everything now is taken for cultures, you know, general cultures, general agar, various specific types of culture media. And these are now put into the machines and they incubate. And often, even within a few hours, you have a very, very specific identification. Sometimes, for example, we saw several examples of where we saw uh, fungi. And they may not be very, very visible on regular hematoxylin and eosin stains. But if you do a slight modification called a PAS stain, standing for periodic acid shift, then it will stain the fungal uh, hyphae or the fungal uh, yeast very, very nicely. Okay, and it's a stain that you could have in your office, and you know, even, uh, uh, and, and you could train anybody to do it as well. It's a very simple stain. Okay, what about tissue culture? Let's say that it's now a virus, and you're not going to see it under a microscope, so it doesn't stain very well. Well, one of the uh, earlier ways, and even still used now a lot, is to know that certain specific viruses have predictable cytopathologic effects on tissue culture cells. They may be epithelial cells, they may be cells from a rabbit or a rat or a horse, but you know that they have a very predictable pattern of cytopathologic effect when these viruses are put on those cells uh, and the CPE is still widely used to uh, identify 
very sometimes very specific uh, infectious pathogens. Probably uh, something that doesn't look at the bug directly, but is very, very specific, is to measure the antibodies. And of course, the list of infectious diseases which evokes specific antibodies is probably almost as long as the list of all infectious diseases itself. So uh, you want to uh, know if the patient has a mononucleosis caused by the EB virus, you know, you see if there's antibodies. Uh, the general rule is uh, if the uh, uh, organism has been present and exposed, there's probably have been some buildup of antibodies, and those antibodies can be uh, identified very, very, very specifically. Sometimes they're combined with fluorescent dyes. Sometimes they just give very, very specific uh, agglutination responses. You know, sometimes they have to be reacted with things from even other species as well. You know, like a heterophile antibody, for example. It's called heterophile. Those are the antibodies in mono. Is because hetero means different. So heterophile antibodies in mononucleosis cause another species of blood cells, a horse, to agglutinate. Of course, nowadays with all of our gene probes, uh, probably the absolute most specific and the most sensitive way to identify very, very specific organisms as well as strains of organisms is to look at their nucleic acid, and that's PCR the so-called polymerase chain reaction. And when you, uh, in, in the older days, when we were looking at the progress of AIDS, for example, we were actually looking at the patient's, you know, T lymphocyte count uh, to see whether how uh, uh, many they had, well, how fast they were losing them. Now we can actually measure the viral load, which is a modified polymerase chain reaction. We're actually looking at viral DNA. Uh, exquisitely sensitive and exquisitely specific. So these are the general diagnostic techniques. Um, now we're going to get into something that looks like it's something that we did before. And it is. It's going to look to you right now like we are repeating the discussion of the inflammatory reaction because the reactions that pathogens produce are inflammatory reactions. Remember, we already said that infectious diseases uh, is a large, perhaps half or more, of what we call inflammatory diseases. So remember, they could produce a suppurative reaction in the acute stage, or they could progress into a chronic, which is basically infiltration by lymphocytes and macrophages rather than neutrophils if it's suppurative. A suppurative response may also produce a positive culture. A chronic inflammatory response may not produce a positive culture. Even a suppurative response may not produce a positive culture. Here, let's make this very simple. And I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you all a question now. You have a patient uh, that has uh, a suspected infection, okay? One patient has pus, and the other patient has an area that's mostly, oh, kind of scarred down or maybe granulating with a lot of blood vessels. Which patient is most likely to produce a positive culture of an organism? A suppurative response, which is acute inflammation, pus, abscess, or a mononuclear, which is a chronic one. It's mostly lymph. Okay, they both could, but it's more likely that's in the suppurative response because that means they may very well still be, you know, have the, having the neutrophils, you know, chew them up all over. But don't forget a variant of the mononuclear response, which is chiefly a macrophage, or if you want to use the term monocyte, because monocytes are the same as macrophages, you know that is the granulomatous response. And basically TB and fungi and sarcoid and foreign bodies are the main general producers of the granulomatous response. A chronic inflammatory response may progress into fibrosis. Remember, does this look familiar? Acute inflammation, chronic inflammation, fibrosis. The fibrosis may be coupled with uh, deposition of blood pigment. You may see hemosiderin 
and very often uh, especially in the fibrotic responses you may just see calcified areas as well so let's look at these uh, pictorially now uh, this is an appendix you can see the nice smooth muscle cells arranged linearly the nuclei look like cigars and you got a lot of neutrophils and it may be in some areas Oh, I don't know, there's just maybe more neutrophils here. So this is a acute inflammatory response. The reason why I probably shouldn't put this in is because, you know, we generally don't think acute appendicitis is caused by a specific bacteria or even bacteria in general. It has an element of uh, ischemia. It may be preceded by a stone or a fecalith being in there. It may be part of a reaction to necrosis of the wall due to lack of blood. It also may be complicated by the enteric bacteria then chewing it up. But this is a general acute inflammatory response. Now, let's say that we're only looking at the left side of this picture, and I'm going to ask you a question. Is that strictly an acute inflammatory response, or would anybody want to call that an abscess? Here, let's make this simple. Is this an abscess on the left side, yes or no? Ah, you're all saying no, so you know that. I can't fool you anymore. Uh, what about this guy here? Here's a soft tissue infection. Uh, it looks like it's causing a lot of swelling of the skin. This may very well have been lanced. And now let me ask you this. These are 100% neutrophils and fibrin. And what's the definition of 100% neutrophils and fibrin. It's an abscess. Okay. We had an old doctor at the VA hospital, and he had a principle, and I think I should probably mention it to you right now. It's kind of a thing that you might remember. He said, piss and pus must come out. So it's very, po and that's generally a pretty good rule, you know. If you have a big abscess like this, I don't think you want to let it fester in there. I think a very good thing is to drain it, maybe even insert something in there that has antibiotics. And of course, we know piss has to come out because if it doesn't, you die. Okay, this is a question that's open for discussion. I'm going to take a survey here. How many of you would like to call this uh, chronic inflammation versus how many people would like to call this organizing inflammation. So just say chronic or organizing is your answer. I see chronic. I see chronic. I see chronic. I see organizing. I see another chronic. I see a couple more organizing. Well, guess what? You're both right. Because remember, in the organizing phase of inflammation, not only do you see chiefly macrophages and mononuclear cells? You can see the ingrowth of blood vessels as well. So I call this chronic inflammation. Most of these cells are not neutrophils. Most of them are lymphocytes and macrophages. You don't see any lobularity to any of these nuclei. Uh, but there's also some ingrowth of vessels. You can call them whatever you want. You're both right. Now, everybody's going to know what this is. This is a granulomatous reaction to infectious pathogens. Now, you have to understand this right now. I may have said it before, but I want to say it even more clearly. Just, if you took the list of all the bacteria and all the viruses and all the fungi that could possibly evoke a granulomatous response, you would probably have a list of hundreds of things. Okay, many bacteria, many viruses. However, let's turn over the other side of the coin. I will tell you that whenever you do see a granuloma, and this is in the lung, I think you all recognize that right away, but whenever you do see a granuloma, you don't think of those hundreds of things. You only think of four things. One of them are mycobacteria. Tuberculosis is a mycobacteria. Leprosy is a mycobacteria. Okay, there are a lot of what they call atypical mycobacteria. They generally all evoke granulopatous responses. Now, the other, other big thing is fungi. Okay, 
Even though fungi can produce suppurative responses, calcification, hemorrhage, chronic inflammation, you know, the most common type of reaction to a fungal infectious pathogen is a granuloma. Whether it's a superficial fungi near the skin, which is called dermatophytes, or whether it's a deep fungus, of which if it's a deep fungus, it could probably be 30 different species, but 98% of the time, it's going to be either histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, or coccidial mycosis. I guess I could throw in cryptococcosis as well, but I don't want to. So a granulomatous response. You know, when I gave my oral exams last year to the people that did Rock Lab and they wanted to impress me, I almost always asked them questions about granuloma. And you want to know why? Because that was on my oral exam. What about this? Let me ask you a question to see if you are basically um, can be fooled. You all know that there's a lot of glandular structures here, okay? You know that. So the question is, do you think that this is a adenocarcinoma, or do you think this is fibrosis within a gland? Generally speaking, most glandular organs, I don't know if this is a pancreas or a salivary gland, or even a breast, but most of the time, if it's an adenocarcinoma, it would generally still not grow in a lobulated fashion like this is. So this is fibrosis within a lobule. So fibrosis is the end point of any type of inflammation. It's not specific for infectious diseases. I just wanted to show you some fibrous tissue. Here, you see all those little spindly cells there? Those are fibroblasts. You see all of these little spindly cells here between the glands? Those are fibroblasts. Well, the more I see this, the more I think it might be a pancreas, but I, I don't really see any islets. Uh, maybe that's part of an islet. I'm not too sure. Okay, somebody I see asked a question uh, to Dr. Kamat, and I don't know if he's here. So I'm just going to pop open the attendee list and see if he's here. And if he's here, I'm going to enable him to answer the questions. Let me look at the long list here. Um, he might have popped in, and I don't even know it. So... No, he's not here. So you know what I'll do? I'm going to look at your questions during the break uh, and answer the big ones because I don't think Dr. Kamat is here today. Okay. Another thing that's not unusual to see with infectious inflammatory responses, but any inflammatory response, is that if you have an area where blood is breaking down because of the destructive inflammatory or infectious process is very likely this blood pigment is going to be picked up by the macrophages and eventually turned into the main storage form of iron in your body which is hemosiderin and they'll just look like intrinsic pigments you know they'll look like little dark golden brown granular stuff inside of macrophages it may totally and probably will usually obscure the pigment will obscure the nucleus of the macrophage, so they may just look like the whole cell is a nucleus. And of course, to prove that that is hemosiderin, you know, rather than uh, melanin or bile, you know, you would do the Prussian blue, and only the hemosiderin will turn nice and blue. Of course, if you have enough experience and you know that there's been a hemorrhage in the area and you see this, you're probably not even going to bother doing the stain. You're not going to be suspecting a malignant melanoma. You know, you're just going to be saying, oh, this is just chronic hemorrhage. Very, very rarely would you do that. And, uh, and last but not least, of course, in the uh, reaction, you get calcification. Now, you know this is probably a kidney, but you see this is a classical appearance for calcification, very often accompanying fibrosis. I think I could convince you pretty easily that there's a lot of fibrous tissue between these tubules or glands. Well, I'm guessing it's kidney, but it might not be. It, it could be. The important thing is, is that the calcium always looks jagged, very, very dark, bluish black. And even though it may be look black instantly, if you really zoom it up on high power, it's more of a really, really dark purplish blue. Another thing is because it's calcium, 
it's not going to cut with the nice smooth texture of human protoplasm it's going to cut like a rock it's going to be jagged it may go off the plane of the cutting blade even it may even be absent if that little stone is big enough to pop out but this is classical calcium okay uh, I was going to say that nothing else in the body really looks like it, but when we get to the uh, uh, chapter on heart valves, sometimes vegetations of bacteria can look a lot like this too. I can't think of anything else that looks like it. Okay, where are we time-wise? Oh my God, we did the first hour already. Uh, we're not going at a speed I would like, but we're going at a speed that I do uh, like I feel very comfortable with. So we'll take our break now. We'll take our 10 minute break. And then we're going to go start into the main biggies. We talked a lot about taxonomy and weird infectious things and we ran across our taxonomy briefly. Now we're going to be talking about the main patterns of infections of viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. We'll do that after the break. And I'll also uh, take a look at your uh, questions during the break and I'll also take my dog out during the break and I will also play music by Marina Buriak uh, during the break who has submitted us music from a uh, European uh, song competition so all the songs that we hear today are winners uh, see you in 10 minutes folks whoops I played that one already let's try this one
were really nice songs. I had a, only a couple of thoughts while we were on break, and uh, one of them was the music in general uh, that uh, we, we got from Marina. I guess this is what you would call Euro pop. You know, of all the different kinds of music we talk about and play, we normally don't say Euro pop. Now, we know that groups like ABBA have pioneered the so-called concept, but I'll tell you one thing about Euro pop that's very easy to dance to it has like a lot of big drums and like so like if some of you got up and danced around a little bit like I did during the break uh, I think today would be the day to do it because this is really really good dance music the other thought that I got today is that I told you I was gonna let Woofy out uh, and then come back in a few minutes sometimes I let Woofy out he decides to run all over the neighborhood and it takes me a lot of time to find them. Sometime hours, you know, we've even gotten busted by the police a couple of times. I have to pick them up at the police station or the dog pound. Woofy just loves to run around. Um, but Woofy was a good boy today and he came right back, so I was able to come back in 10 minutes also. The third thought that I got, and I have to explain it now, is uh, I'm sort of happy with the way this chapter is going this year. Uh, Generally speaking, I kind of dread the infectious disease chapters for the reasons I told you, but it seems to be going much better, and I think the reason for that is we probably did them too fast in previous years. So uh, I think if I just don't worry about time constraints at all and just talk about things at my best rate, I think that a lot of the chapters that are not my favorites may wind up being my favorite. So, you know... I think we're doing a good job with infectious disease this year. So let's uh, keep doing it then. Now, we're not going to probably finish it today, but in the next session, most likely we will, and then we could do a big infectious disease lab as well. So what are the biggies? What are the big infectious groups? Well, no surprise, viruses, bacteria, fungi, especially in immunocompromised people, but even in not and in immunocompromised people, and the parasites, something we ignore, but when you look at the number of people worldwide that have parasites, it's probably the majority of the inhabitants of planet Earth. So even though viruses are very hard to classify by uh, taxonomy, they don't always make sense, one way you can classify them is into their patterns of diseases. So one way to class, if you wanted to classify viruses into four categories, even though they may have totally different genus and species names, <clears throat> one of them is the clinical pattern of being an acute disease 
which is transient. It means it goes away in a few days, maybe a couple weeks. And of course, these are a lot of our so-called childhood diseases that we now have vaccines for, so we may not see them. Measles, mumps, polio. These were all diseases that kind of attacked people by various methods pretty quickly. And then they did their uh, damage and then they were either healed or they may have had some long-lasting effects like in polio if it attacked the uh, the anterior horn cells may have left the person with either permanent paralysis deformities or even death if it involved the diaphragm muscle a lot of talk at least in the United States about the West Nile virus you could throw that into the same category a lot of the encephalitides also by arthropod born vectors can be put in that category. You will see an acute effect, could be severe, could even be fatal, but generally it's transient, it goes away. So that's one category. Now, the second category is what we would call chronic latent viruses. And isn't it a coincidence again that almost all of the common viral diseases that are in the chronic latent family are herpes family again, herpes simplex, herpes zoster, and CMV. And these are infections that occur, and in this case, they can be expressed in the skin, they could be expressed in even deeper organs. You know, CMV can basically infect anything. But uh, they may come back. They may be dormant, and they may come back after many years. They can just live around, maybe hang around in the dorsal root ganglion like herpes virus, uh, herpes zoster does, and then, you know, come back and cause skin eruptions. So chronic latent is a nice general clinical category. And another one is chronic, and that's a virus that kind of it persists. So in uh, the best example that are in the hepatitis, some of these different viruses, whether we're talking about A, B, C, D, they may uh, persist chronically for many, many years. They may ultimately result in cirrhosis if they persist long enough or hard enough and may also be a setting for hepatoma as well. So the family of chronic viral infections is best typified by the various t forms of viral hepatitis. They don't have any sense to their naming either. They were just called ABC in the order in which they were discovered. Now the most interesting general category of viruses are the viruses that we know in humans are linked with the development of tumors, of even malignant tumors. And those are the so-called transforming viruses. We've introduced this concept already. We said that a transforming virus will do its usual thing by attaching to a cell, by entering a cell, but it may not do much translation or multiplication for a long, long time. It just may be stay there, and even for years, and it may pop up months or years later with a tumor. Now in the case of HPV, which is a classical transforming virus, that might result in a benign or a malignant proliferation of a stratified squamous mucosa, like cervix or skin or oral cavity, for example. Now we said that the Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, very, very common uh, cause the cause, as a matter of fact, of infectious mononucleosis also causes a lymphoma, absolutely uh, documented, called the Burkitt's lymphoma. So these are interesting things. Not only can the viruses do whatever they do, but they could kind of hang around for a long time and perhaps after months, years, cause cancers as well. In the bacteria, the best general classification for bacterial diseases still is the old gram stain. Gram positive being blue takes up the crystal violet because it has uh, uh, one layer of lipid membrane. Gram negative being two and not taking up the stain and therefore having to be stained with a red counter stain. But if you just want to make it simple, you'll be doing gram stains all the time, most likely, somewhere. Gram positive is blue, gram negative is red. Even though the red is not due to the lack of the stain, it's due to a counter stain. And of course, there's the mycobacteria, which don't really stain well with gram at all. 
They're stained by uh, an acid fast technique, often called the Zeal Nielsen technique. They can also be stained by a lot of other immune antibody techniques. And then there's the spirochetes. They don't really stain very well and they don't culture very well. So the best way to examine them is to get them live and to use a type of uh, identification called a dark field microscopy. Now, you can also identify bacteria groups, whether they're aerobic or anaerobic. We've defined that already, but the anaerobic bacteria, you know, don't need oxygen. They may use it if it's around, in which case they're a facultative anaerobe. Uh, but that's another general thing. They may be gram-positive, they may be gram-negative. So there's an overlap there, isn't there? And of course, we're not going to go into them too much, but there's the obligate intercellular organisms, or maybe you want to call them OIBs, because even though most of these bacteria can uh, live freely and even be cultured with some exceptions, the OIBs have to live inside of other cells, otherwise they just can't do anything. In terms of the overall categories of fungi, I like this one even best because morphologically fungi in human tissues are either going to look like balls, you know, like the cocci bacteria look like balls, or they're going to look like they're hyphae or little straight rods, just like the same, the same general uh, analogy as we did with the cocci and the bacilli. Only with fungi you call them yeasts or molds, and the molds are generally better termed hyphae. So, without a doubt, the single most common fungal yeast infection is candida. We all have a little bit of candida on us now. Usually, uh, in terms of perhaps immune suppression, this uh, might affect especially moist, non keratinized stratified squamous mucosa, like the oral cavity, like the esophagus, like the vagina, for example. And cryptococcus, we kind of uh, ignored that. Cryptococcus is basically a yeast in human infections. It's not a hyphae, and it's usually systemic, and it can infect anything, just like candida can infect anything. The big thing we worry about with cryptococcus is it's a, it's a major cause of meningitis, especially in immunosuppressed patients. Now the molds. The molds in general, the hyphal forms that we'll see, even though a lot of the so-called dermatophytes may have hyphae, the general mold infections are things like aspergillus and mucormycosis. And once again, I'm going to tell you that you'll probably not see these diseases definitely in your patients. And if you do, most likely they're immunosuppressed in some way. So in general, fungal infections are so much more common in immunosuppressed patients. We re we're going to go over a couple of the parasites again. We're going to talk more about malaria, but generally you might want to think of parasites as either being one cell, which is protozoans, the whole family of those. We said that they could either be in the mucosa, they could invade the cell, they could go into the blood, or they could be metazoans, which is more than one cell. And those are generally worms. And even though... Uh, it, um, arthropods are also more than one cell. They're generally not called metazoic parasites. They're called ectozoic parasites. So let's start out with the viral. And these are diseases which uh, you probably, you know, th you, 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 there's still outbreaks of some of the childhood diseases like mumps, which we think are cured in the United States, but they still pop up every now and then even in the so-called developed countries and in the third world countries they may be major epidemics but they're clinically they uh, come on quick they come on acute and they resolve quickly too transient and acute measles was the same way you know measles and mumps you know if you have a professor that is about my age and I'll uh, gladly admit I'm 65 there's a good chance they had measles and mumps Probably none of you have ever had it. None of your kids will ever have it because these are all definitely diseases that have been uh, well vaccinated now. Same thing as polio. Polio, uh, a little bit more, uh, quite a bit more serious than measles and mumps. It was the greatest fear when I was a kid, and now it's been virtually cured with the vaccine. I believe Dr. Jonas Salk, either he got the Nobel Prize or he certainly deserved it. 
and uh, was one of my heroes. Uh, then, of course, there are the transient acute uh, meningitides, meningoencephalitides. I would say it's probably more likely to be an encephalitis than a meningitis, but it can involve both the covering of the brain, the meninges, as well as the brain itself, encephalitis. And we could use West Nile now, very popular disease to be afraid of in the United States as another disease which is transient and acute. Here's measles, okay, that's a typical kid with a bunch of the red spots. You know it's preceded by a respiratory infection. It's spread through respiratory secretions. Um, Almost all of the giant cells that we showed you in various diseases so far were in the macrophage line. The so-called measles giant cells that you might see in infected tissues, especially the lung, measles pneumonia, you know, don't ever, ever think of measles as only a little skin rash. Measles uh, can affect the central nervous system, the lungs, and when it's killed kids, it usually killed them because of the pneumonia. Uh, another thing to remember about measles, although you never see it, is that very often in the oral cavity you'll see these little red spots. I think you can see a better one here. You see that little red spot there? They seem to be a little more confluent here. Because remember, it's not just skin, it's preceded by upper respiratory. Very often the pediatrician would examine the baby and they see these little red spots and they would say to the mother, uh, they're going to break out in the skin lesions you know, in a couple of days, and they were always right, and the mother always thought the doctor was so smart. So the Coplic spots, K-O-P-L-I-K, usually precede the uh, respiratory and, and skin uh, lesions. Okay, I'm not going to say much more about it, because, you know, hopefully you'll never treat it, but if you do, you're going to learn a lot more about it then than you will today, I'll tell you. Here's mumps, regarded as, if you remember, we call this a digestive tract virus because salivary glands are part of your digestive tract <clears throat> and excuse me and uh, you know swollen parotid glands like you see here or here and these two kids they're primarily uh, unilateral but they could be bilateral of course in young kids are probably uh, inf an infectious parotitis in kids is probably mumps until proven otherwise. Of course, if it's not in a mumps endemic area, you may start to think of some of the more rare things. And if you think that this is a picture of a salivary gland lobule with inflammatory cells, which is of course what you'd expect to see, this is not a salivary gland lobule at all. Does anybody know what this little round tubule is over here? Anybody want to take a guess? It's a seminiferous tubule. This is just to remind you that not only does it affect the exocrine glands of the oral cavity, it also affects the exocrine glands of the GI tract, in other words, the pancreas, and uh, as well as the uh, testicle. So a orchitis in a young kid probably mumps. Okay, what about the other one we mentioned, polio? You could tell this is one of the world's most perfect neurons. You know, it has a lot of nissel substance in it. Um, there's a big nucleus. You're kind of wondering maybe could there possibly be inclusions in there? Of course, if you go away from the neuron and you go into the general uh, CNS tissue as well, you might see a lot of inflammation, a lot of edema a lot of demyelination. And this, of course, are the features of inflammatory diseases of the central nervous system. In this case, it happens to be the ventral horn or the anterior horn, if you will, you can call it either one, uh, to affect lower motor neurons, resulting in paralysis. And most of the people who died of polio died from uh, these inflammatory reactions in the ventral horns of the uh, cells that control the diaphragm, so-called iron lung. Probably the, the greatest fear when I was a kid uh, is knowing that some of your friends uh, went into an iron lung and some may have died and you know polio still was still around, but not anymore. So just remember the one thing with polio as well, you know we all know the ultimate worst feared neurologic things, but basically it's an infection 
of the uh, gastrointestinal uh, lymphoid tissue and the upper respiratory lymphoid tissue as well. So if you want to read this, there are certain types of cells like the M cells in Peyer's patches or the CD155 receptors, you know, in the uh, intestinal mucosa that are, are more specifically involved. And there's polio. Hopefully we'll never see it again. Something that we will see a lot of and we uh, probably uh, have seen cases of it. We may even worry about it in our area like we do in the United States are these so-called encephalitis viruses. We ran off a list of, of a bunch of them, but nowadays the big one is West Nile. It's like the other, most of the other encephalitis viruses spread. Uh, they are arthropod-borne viruses. So arbovirus is not a genus or a species name. It's the fact that it's arthropod-borne. Well, his central nervous system tissue here, it doesn't look too bad, does it? And here's some central nervous system tissue down here. This doesn't look terribly bad. But look, look at the blood vessels inside of the central nervous system. This is encephalitis. This is not meningeal tissue. This is brain tissue. This is an encephalitis. So most viral encephalitis, even though if it's severe, it can involve the entire brain, usually, especially in the earlier stages, most viral encephalitis is an inflammatory infiltrate around the blood vessels in the brain or in central nervous system. So it is a absolute true statement to say, and if you have a pencil and paper, you could write this down. It's something I remembered for many years. Most viral encephalitis, and perhaps most encephalitis in general, most encephalitis is viral, by the way, um, is lymphocytic cuffing of the central nervous system blood vessels. Uh, there's a name for this. They call this the virkow robbins space. You don't hear that uh, name so much, but we know that Va Dr. Virkow is our hero because he's the father of pathology, and Dr. Robbins is our hero because he's the author of Robbins, but this is not the same Dr. Robbins. This is a classical picture for encephalitis. I wouldn't be surprised if some joker on the step exam threw in a picture like this. If I was on the board, I would probably do it. Okay, what about the chronic latent viruses now? We all said that generally they're all in the same family, the herpes family, of which herpes simplex is obvious. You know, type 1 classically being oral, type 2 uh, classically being genital, but there's so much overlap. The CMV if you think CMV causes large basophilic intranuclear inclusions, that's probably why it might have the term megalo. And of course, the same virus that caused the childhood disease, now almost absent, called chickenpox, or varicella, also causes the skin eruptions, which are usually associated with very, very, very big pain because it's traveling along a nerve root now. The virus may uh, take residence in the dorsal root ganglion for a long time and then spread through the portions of the dermatome of the skin that is supplied by that dorsal root ganglion. So here's a herpes virus, technically vesicles, as you know, perhaps not as fresh looking as this. They may be ulcerated, they may be secondarily infected. They may be acute disease, they may be chronic disease, they may be fibrosis if it's long enough. Here's the genital variant. And whereas in the very early things, you may see a couple of nice little vesicles, which maybe there's a few left here, but most likely it's been traumatized and it's ulcerated. And it's most likely gonna look like this. So uh, don't expect uh, uh, genital herpes to look like nice little vesicles. Most likely it won't. And of course, uh, the cells that infect them themselves may have intranuclear inclusions. And I said this last class, but I'll say it again. Most of the viruses in the herpes family produce intranuclear inclusions. Okay? So, herpes simplex, 
produces intranuclear inclusion. Usually, if you look hard enough, it may not be in every cell, of course. Cytomegalovirus produces intranuclear inclusions. Varicella zoster produces intranuclear inclusions. But here's the question, folks. Which one of these three are basophilic inclusions rather than eosinophilic inclusions? Yes, yeah, CMV is basophilic. And it may look a little pinker than it should be, but if the stain is done properly, they've always classically uh, um, divided, uh, uh, they always classically have said CMV is basophilic. The other two are basically more redder, okay? So if you see a viral inclusion in an infected area, and you know that H, uh, the herpes family of viruses is ubiquitous. They couldn't infect anything. Don't think of herpes as just skin. It causes pneumonia. It could cause uh, uh, GI infections, renal infections, anything you could think of. Here is a uh, CMV pneumonia. You might recognize part of an alveolus here, maybe. And you could see that there's a big cell. But look at there's a giant intranuclear inclusion. And here, let me ask you this question. Is this big or megalo inclusion, is this blue or red? It's blue. What if it was herpes simplex or herpes zoster infecting something else? Would it be blue or red? Okay, good. And remember, even though it's called, it doesn't have the word herpes in it, it's still in the herpes family. So CMV is human herpes virus dash five. And I think we said that even the virus that causes Kaposi sarcoma is also a HHV, and I believe it was seven, if I remember correctly. Here's herpes zoster. It could be, they say that the pain of shingles, or herpes zoster, can often mimic a heart attack, a kidney stone. It could be very, very severe. Uh, sometimes it's relieving to see that it's uh, followed by vesicular dermatome type eruption. So if you're actually to map out classically this area here, you could almost guess, you know, which dorsal root ganglion on the right may have been uh, infected with the uh, zoster virus. And another curious thing is that you know that when a kid gets chicken pox or varicella, they're immune. They don't get it again, okay? And even though it's caught, the same virus causes herpes zoster, they can get herpes zoster. Isn't that weird? So even though it's the same virus, immunity to varicella does not guarantee immunity to herpes zoster, even though they're the same virus. Another thing I could tell you is that if you get shingles more than once, the doctor will say, okay, well, let's look for the lymphoma. So people that have multiple bouts of herpes zoster uh, usually have significantly impaired uh, immunity and lymphomas are very, very highly related. There's a vesicle, you know, like this could technically be a herpes simplex vesicle, couldn't it? It's a vesicle. Maybe if you looked at the cells, you might see some red intranuclear inclusions and here's just some inflammatory response that's going along with it. And remember, a lot of these secondary uh, affected or the ones that look like they have pus in them, the ones, the vesicles that be, have uh, eventually secondary acute infection are called pustules. You know, they may be secondarily infected because of bacteria. Okay, what about the so-called chronic viruses? We talked about hepatitis A, B, C. We also know that there is a more exotic, you know, D and E which is not generally nearly as common as these three, but these are the three big ones, and they're also the order in which they were uh, discovered. You know, hepatitis A, usually subclinical, very universal. You know, it's very possible most of us may have been exposed to it, whether even if we're in a so-called developed country. The two hepatitis viruses of major concern are B and C. And of course, probably on the other side of the planet that I'm sitting on right now, B is the major concern. And probably on my side of the planet, they might have more of a concern for C because both of these viruses are chronic. Their chronicity can lead to cirrhosis. So a 
uh, post hepatitic cirrhosis is probably either due to B or C and guess what they are also the seeds for malignancies of the liver also so you know I went to Hong Kong last year and there was a big conference on the liver cancer and I said to my friend Jim from China I said isn't most of the uh, uh, hepatomas from uh, hepatitis C he says you are on the wrong side of the planet in Asia in China in Mid East in Africa most of the vir most of the hepatomas from hepatitis B because it's much more common there okay so that's the general rule for the chronic viruses another thing I'll tell you I'm showing you a total uh, normal liver and I think I'd rather show you a total normal liver right now than uh, a liver that has hepatitis but you know the so-called milder hepatitis viral hepatitis will show infiltrates mostly in the so-called portal area which you recognize here of course if it gets more severe or prolonged it can also infect you know not just the portal area but the areas between the portal tract and the central vein yeah so-called other parts of the lobule as well so technically if you knew this was a normal liver and believe me it is because it's one of the most normal livers I've ever seen and you saw a lot of peppering of inflammatory cells you might think this patient may have had a chronic hepatitis however guess what there's something I forgot to tell you and I'm gonna tell you right now if you see chronic inflammatory cells in the liver in other words lymphocytes macrophages we call these chronic inflammatory cells. The patient may have acute hepatitis clinically. And that's what I forgot to say about the encephalitis too. Remember I told you that lymphocytic cuffing of the blood vessels of the brain is encephalitis. And even though lymphocytes are chronic inflammatory cells, the clinical expression of the disease may be an acute encephalitis. So remember we said West Nile was in an acute transient viral disease? Even though it was an acute disease clinically, the chronic inflammatory cells in the brain blood vessels are usually lymphocytes. Okay, here is not a normal liver, but you could see a scattering of cells. And you see that there are some cells here that look like they're kind of orange. Maybe if you remember, we, when we talked about apoptosis, we said that the cells generally get redder and the nucleus disappears. Well, the apoptosis or pathologic apoptosis of liver cells with hepatitis may produce these little orangish type cells. In the old days, they were called councilman bodies. And we were told that councilman bodies are, you know, maybe they're almost diagnostic for hepatitis. Well, they're not. They're found in practically, theoretically, any destructive process in the liver in which the poptosis is being is occurring at an, uh, a, an advanced rate. Even normally in the liver, if you look long enough, you may see a normal apoptotic cell, but an acute viral hepatitis, you say, may have more of these. So if you want to know what they were called in the old days and still now, they're called councilman bodies. And then we get to the chapter on uh, alcoholic hepatitis, which is not a viral disease. You have similar looking structures, but it's called a Mallory body rather than a councilman body. They also call it alcoholic hyaline. Well, you see a apoptotic looking cell in a viral hepatitis. You call that a councilman body. Okay, what about the so-called transforming viruses? Wouldn't be fair if we didn't say a couple of words. We already did. The two most important transforming group of viruses humans are the Epstein-Barr virus and HPV, the human papilloma virus. Remember, this is not in the herpes family. This is in the papilloma family. We know that EBV causes mononucleosis. We're going to show you. In the way, it's kind of a acute transient disease. But that virus can then be uh, go dormant, and at some point in time, not only cause malignant lymphoma that we call Burkitt's lymphoma, but even some of the nasopharyngeal carcinomas are totally linked to EB virus as well. 
and you know there's a whole bunch of strains of HPV you know there's at least up to 18 there's probably 20 30 who knows but the two that are always mentioned at the top of the list the two strains that are the most highly related to proliferations especially malignant proliferations of squamous cell like in the cervix are type 16 and 18 you might want to remember those two numbers too um, here's mono you know the reason it's called mono is because the lymphocytes look like monocytes that means this rather normal looking lymphocyte although you might say well you know it looks like it might even look a little bit plasma cytoid because it has a little bit of a clear zone well if this was a lymphocyte in the peripheral blood and it obviously is um, you probably think it's more likely to be a B cell than a T cell because it looks like it might be starting to form some antibodies there but if you see a lot of cells in the peripheral blood that are lymphocytes but they look like they have bigger nuclei more irregular nuclei and not a little lip or thin rim of cytoplasm but kind of a, a flamey irregular these are called atypical lymphocytes and they may look like monocytes and I believe that's why how monocyte mononucleosis got its name there's still a lot of people even physicians that think that mononucleosis is called mononucleosis because these are monocytes but they're lymphocytes the diagnosis of course is clinical you have to have a whopping pharyngitis you have to have palpable lymph nodes some of the biggest spleens even the ones that are susceptible to rupture acutely are with regular old mono there's also a hepatitis hepatomegaly a viral sort of hepatitis picture as well they may have elevated liver enzymes they may have a spleen that's in danger of rupturing they have lymph nodes especially posterior cervical lymph nodes and they have to have a whopping pharyngitis that's how you make the diagnosis you confirm the diagnosis by taking their serum and mixing it in with horse blood cells that's why they're called heterophile antibodies because hetero means different okay so you got the antibodies from one species humans causing horse red blood cells to agglutinate a positive heterophile test means uh, mono infectious mononucleosis that means that has been under the influence of the E B virus what about the papilloma virus let's say that you were looking at a pap smear and from everything we've seen so far uh, you know these cells are very 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 suspicious for malignancy they're huge they're dark they're bumpy they're irregular even if you never took a simple basic course in cytotechnology I know that by now if you saw a cluster of cells like this on a pap smear you'd say malignant but here's my question let's say you did see these malignant epithelial looking cells on a pap smear this is the most important question can you prove that was infiltrating malignancy or you can just say they are shedded malignant cells yeah they're just shedded you know we can't prove they're infiltrating because remember a pap smear is just a surface cell these could still be uh, what they call high-grade dysplasia this could be carcinoma in situ this could be called what they call CIN3 or what they now call under the Bethesda system HSIL they're just malignant looking squamous cells well when you see this you know that this was caused by HPV or if you don't mind their redundancy HPV virus the human papilloma virus and uh, there are more types than 16 and 18 that cause this, but those are always at the top of the list okay let's see where we are in terms of time oh we, we could probably make a little dent into the bacteria I think um, let's talk about the the general classes and patterns of bacterial infections now in humans we've already learned the general acronym that uh, cocci are generally gram positive and uh, bacilli are generally gram negative but here are the exceptions down here with cocci the gram positive exception is Neisseria with bacilli the gram negative exception is 
A B C C L L P. I think you should remember that because A B stands for a bacillus anthracis backwards. That's why it doesn't have to be an A and a B. C is Cornobacterium, that's diphtheria. C is for Clostridium, that's a whole wide variety of infections. L is for Lactobacillus, usually a non infectious, helpful bacteria. Listeria, causing a disease called listeriosis. And the common bacteria complicates acne by virtue of uh, feeding off of the uh, body's plugged uh, sebaceous glands, propionobacterium acne. These are all gram-positive bacilli. Everything else is gram-negative, pretty much. So, you know, those are your so-called pyogenic bacteria. Now, uh, can you really tell in all honesty whether that's staph or strep? Uh, Maybe some real high-level microbiologist could, but for all purposes, if you can see a ball and if you can see it's blue, just call it a, a gram-positive cocci. It may be in a, a, a pus exudate. It may here, it looks like it's mixed in with fiber. You may even see them inside of uh, 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 neutrophils as well, or macrophages even. Okay, I'm not going to tell you what staph and strep uh, in fact other than everything. Staph and strep infect everything. They, you like to think of them as chiefly skin and respiratory tract, but just about any acute pyogenic infection anywhere, I don't care where it is, I don't care if it's brain, I don't care if it's uh, kidney, liver, you think of a um, big abscess that you're draining, even before you get the culture results, you're going to think probably staph or strep. Okay, always at the top of the list. Specifically in Staphylococcus, we know that's a common wound infection. You know, uh, it causes a inflammatory skin reaction, uh, usually in kids, called impentigo. I guess adults can get it as well. You know that a lot of secondary folliculitis, you know, furuncles, carbuncles, you know, in other words, abscesses are probably staph. They could be strep as well. Most of the endocarditis in dr intravenous drug users is staph. Most of the infectious endocarditis in non-drug users is strep. We know you can have a staphylococcal food poisoning by virtue of this toxin. We know that even staph can produce what they call super toxins, okay? to produce toxic shock syndrome, which we saw with, um, uh, you know, the tampons. And we all know it produce a variety of respiratory infections, pneumonias, abscesses. Did I pretty much cover all parts of the body? Yeah, I did. Because remember, in endocarditis, these little staph things can flake off and they can go to wherever blood goes, which is everywhere in the body. Here's another, uh, here's, we'll talk a little bit about strep now. And if I often uh, get them mixed up, you'll understand why, because they both infect everything. Some things that formerly were more staph often are now more strep, and you know they tend to switch uh, damage every few years. Strep is also basically you know everything but skin and respiratory thing. Here's an interesting disease called, and I hope I'm pronouncing it right, because I've never seen a case of this myself. I think it's called erysipelas, erysipelas, and it's a case in which you have a strep infection producing a very, very red rash, and these are usually in immunocompromised patients as well. And don't forget, even though we're talking about strep and staph as being general bacteria, you know, uh, everywhere, if we have an immunocompromised condition, they can become more popular. So we have this long list of, you know, infections and in immunocompromised people. We didn't put in the common things like staph and strep, but they're there. Um, you know what? I think I put this one a little bit out of place. 
Oh, no, no, no. We're still in the gram positive. Okay? We're going by positive, not balls or rods. Here are gram positive rods. And once again, we're not going to go into all of them. I did make a little bit of a summary here. And this is pretty much as power snapped out of Wikipedia. But, you know, a, a very uh, formerly big killer in the world, diphtheria, caused by Cornobacterium diphtheriae. It was an anaerobe, but it was also gram-positive, and it was a gram-positive rod. So these are all the gram-positive bacilli. You know, um, listeria, a serious infection, frequently fatal, uh, caused by usually eating food contaminated with the bacteria. You know, anthrax, you know, the big fear now with germ warfare. You know, anthrax, before we had germ warfare, was a serious, often fatal disease because the endospores that it produced um, wound up causing a variety of very serious infections. Here we go. Bacillus anthracis. I'm going to try to pop it out for you. Um, plagues or um, epidemics of anthrax were feared. And, but these little spores that technically come are all over the world. You know, even Antarctica. Nocardia is not only gram-positive rod as well, but in many respects, it resembles even uh, taxonomically uh, a fungus as well. So if you want to call Nocardia a bacteria, you should know it's a gram-positive rod. If you want to call it a... Um, excuse me, if you want to call it a uh, fungi, you might not be too wrong about that either. And I did mention, and I'm not going to go into it, the clostridial infections. You know, here are the four major types of clostridial infections. Clostridium botulinum, you know, serious food poisoning produced by a Clostridium botulinum toxin. Clostridium difficile, probably something that you will treat a lot because the Clostridium difficile toxin produces a pseudomembranous colitis in patients that are on broad-spectrum antibiotics is the classical setting. Clostridium perfringens, very often cultured out of gas gangrene. So if you have what they call a uh, inflammatory process somewhere in the body that's producing the gas from bacteria, Clostridium is always at the top of the list. And of course, your classic tetanus as well. They're all in the Clostridium family. They're all gram-positive rods. Okay, now that we got all the gram-positives, the cocci and the bacilli, let's go into the gram-negatives. And the gram-negative cocci are very easy because there's only one major type of cocci that's gram negative and those are the Neisseria. You know the Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitis. So Neisseria gonorrhea, the cause of gonorrhea. Neisseria meningitis, one of the main causes of an epidemic form of meningitis. And let's say that you're looking at a smear of either a urethra or perhaps even spinal fluid in a kid in in a, in a in the setting of a of an epidemic in which the spinal fluid was not clear maybe it was a little milky maybe it was a little white or clouded you're looking at a whole bunch of neutrophils here there's a neutrophil there's a neutrophil there's one there's one there's one probably these are too and you're seeing red cocci, mostly in pairs, but sometimes individually, those are gram-positive cocci. When you see that, you have to think nice area. Of course, you're going to know clinically whether it's a, a meningitis or a urethritis. Now, the big, big, big family of gram-negative rods, because we said that except for A, B, B, C, C, L, L, P, whatever that acronym was, all of the rods are gram-negative. And the the best general area of the body to think of gram-negative rods are in the urinary tract because 
Whenever you talk about a gram-negative infection, E. coli, I don't care where you're at, it's always at the top of the list. Many, many strains of E. coli, the classical gram-negative rod. We know that the uh, whooping cough in kids, Bortadella pertussis, is a gram-negative rod. We know that a lot of these uh, so-called urinary tract pathogens, like Pseudomonas, like Klebsiella, uh, slash aerobacter and E. coli always at the top of the list gram negative rods we know that the plague you know the classical plague that uh, killed a large portion of the planet in the middle ages is a gram negative rod that was called Yersinia pestis okay formerly called Pasturella pestis and a type of uh, sexually transmitted disease which uh, mimics syphilis, but it's not, is also a gram-negative rod. Haemophilus is a gram-negative rod in general, you know, but Haemophilus influenzae is probably the biggest bacteria to worry about in kids under the age of two in terms of respiratory infections, in terms of meningitis, in terms of upper respiratory infections. Uh, but Haemophilus ducreyi, another species as the cause of chancreas. So these are all classical gram-negative rods. But remember, the rule is, if it's not part of that A, B, B, C, L, L, whatever it was, it's, and, it's a, and it's a rod, it's probably going to be gram-negative. Okay. What about... You know, I think I'll stop here. You know, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, and I don't think it's going as badly as it did last year, but we only have a couple of general uh, patterns of bacterial infections which are not easily classified into the gram system. We'll be talking about the acid fast. We'll be talking about the spirochetes. Uh, so we'll save that for uh, next session. And by the way, we're almost done with this. So I can also tell you that most likely we'll finish this entire discussion in the next two hour period, which will be 46 hours from now. But we'll also have a nice lab in the second hour as well. So a lot of these critters that we've been talking about, some of them will actually be identifying under routine stains. Some of them will be being using special stains. But we're going to do a lot of lab work in the next thing. So we're going to wind up spending a total of six hours or three sessions on infectious diseases, which means we're done for the day. Um, now, I guess we could just say goodbye. I'm going to be looking at your comments now and... You know, see if I missed any very, very significant questions. Oh, I probably did. Yeah, somebody reminded me that Kaposi's is HHV8. So if I said 7, I was wrong. Somebody said that HHV7 is Pityriasis rosea. So that's somebody that knows their microbiology. Yeah, you all know that Kaposi's was 8. Um... Let me see if there's anything else that I want to bring to your attention. No, nobody else said I was wrong, so most of the other questions were... Somebody said, it's their birthday today, so maybe I should have played the birthday song. So maybe in the next session, we'll play the birthday song that somebody sent us. So, uh, let's call it a day. And thanks for coming, and... Uh, Actually, this uh, whole thing on infectious disease is not going as bad as I thought it would, simply because I'm taking my time on it. So, you know, the, the greatest fear that a professor has is the same as the greatest fear that a student has, and it's, it's looking stupid. So what I found is if I just take the time to think about things and not just feel like I have to rush down a, a big list of bacteria in five minutes, then I'm not going to look stupid. So... Let's call it a day. We'll close off with our last song by uh, Marina. Whoops, we also accidentally opened that thing too. We'll close off our last song, and we'll see you in 46 hours. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Thirty-six seconds. Rock on, you buzzards. <laughs> 